Hello, boils and ghouls. All right, guys. Welcome to another episode of The Mothman of Point Pleasant. Now, in the last few episodes, we have talked a lot about the Mothman, about the UFO sightings, the strange lights in the sky, all happening in Point Pleasant between November 66 and the bridge collapsing in 67, December. We've talked about the men in black who made their appearance in town. We've talked a few eyewitness sightings. And we've had a little bit of mention in the last episode about John Keel. So, this whole episode is going to be centered around Keel. Now, who was John Keel aside from the writer of The Mothman Prophecies? John A. Keel was an American author and paranormal investigator who gained significant recognition for his research on the Mothman phenomenon. Keel was born on March 25, 1930 in Hornell, New York. Fellow New Yorker, I like him. And unfortunately passed away on July 3rd of 2009. Now, Keel developed a strong interest in the unexplained from an early age and began writing articles on UFOs and other paranormal subjects. In the 1960s, he became actively involved in investigating various paranormal incidents, including, and most famously, the Mothman sightings in Point Pleasant, West Virginia. Keel arrived in Point Pleasant and began investigating all the sightings. And then his book, The Mothman Prophecies, was published in 75, and it went on to become a seminal work on the subject. In his book, Keel not only details the Mothman encounters, but also delves into other strange occurrences in the area, such as UFO sightings, men in black encounters, and other paranormal phenomena. Keel was a very interesting and for me credible witness and researcher in this whole Mothman phenomena. I've read the Mothman prophecies it's been at least 10 years since I've read the book it's been a while since I've seen the movie too which I think is a nice way of wrapping this series up when I do will be a regular discussion video like I do with all, all horror movies and all films on my channel here, and I'll do a video on the Mothman Prophecies film, bringing it back around to film, and that'll be a nice way to close this series out. But it's been a long while since I've read the Mothman Prophecies. But what I've always found very compelling about Keel, he never claimed to understand what went down in Point Pleasant. Like, you see a lot of this with UFO researchers, and I mean, look at the, the fucking ancient alien guy who's on every episode, and this guy's been talking shit for years. <laughs> he makes all of the credible people and researchers in the whole UFO community and everything, paranormal community, makes them look like just as kooky as he is. Can't stand that guy. But Keel was different. He went down there after hearing about these sightings, and he just gathered information. He just went and talked to a bunch of eyewitnesses that, keep in mind, over a hundred sightings of this Mothman just in the 13 months between November of 66 and the bridge collapsing in December of 67. So, we've already talked about group hysteria and if this was a mass hallucination I don't think that holds water we've talked about the crane the Sand Hill crane being misidentified or possibly mutated as much as you guys know how I feel about that theory I still have to leave it on the shelf a possibility as it's one of the only like scientific and logical explanations <laughs> for everything and again it doesn't even account for everything including the ufos and injured cold and all of the other strange phenomena going down in point pleasant all it would explain is the mothman creature itself so it still doesn't explain even anywhere close to everything 
but I have to keep it on the shelf as a possibility just so we have some type of logical explanation so we can go back to. But Keel never claimed to know or figure out exactly what all of this meant. Like, people would write him and talk to him years, decades after the whole incident in Point Pleasant in the late 60s and would say, what happened down there? What happened with the mall fan? And he would say, I have no idea. Like, so it's, it's, he's, he was a very credible person. He could have ran with the story and started just going off with a, all different type of crazy theories and say, oh, I know, I've seen them making stuff up left and right. He didn't do that. He just went, listened, recorded, documented until he started having his own sightings of the lights in the sky, of UFOs, of seeing and being visited by the men in black. So I think it's interesting to this mystery, trying to explain it, and then he got sucked in himself and started experiencing all of these things that everybody he was talking to in town were experiencing. Now, one of Keel's central theories was that the Mothman sightings were not isolated incidents, but part of a larger pattern of high strangeness. He believed that these phenomena were interconnected and tied to a broader cosmic or interdimensional reality. Keel proposed that the Mothman and other supernatural entities were manifestations of a trickster-like intelligence manipulating and influencing human perception. Keel's investigations and writings on the Mothman and other paranormal subjects guarded both acclaim and criticism. His work often challenged conventional explanations and pushed the boundaries of paranormal research. Keel himself coined the term ultra-terrestrial to describe entities that existed beyond our normal understanding of reality. While Keel is primarily known for his association with the Mothman, he investigated numerous other paranormal incidents throughout his career. He explored topics such as UFOs, psychic phenomena, ancient mysteries, conspiracy theories. He has other books including Our Haunted Planet, Disneyland of the Gods, The Eighth Tower, and these all reflected his wide-ranging interests and in unconventional approach to the unexplained. Now, one thing that we've touched on a little bit, but didn't go greater into, is the theory that the Mothman is some type of harbinger of doom, or a good omen slash a bad omen, or in some way is trying to warn or tell people about an upcoming disaster. Now, of course, we know how tragic the Silver Bridge collapse was. Now, mind you, and they do a very, very good job in the film, The Mothman Prophecies, of really capturing how devastating the bridge collapse was for this small town. You hear 46 people die in a tragedy. Nowadays, that's like, all right, so 40-something 40, 40 people, that's right. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, the Twin Towers, when that happened, you have thousands of casualties, and you have plane crashes, you have a hundred-something people died. So when you hear a bridge collapse, 46 people died, some people just brush that off and say, eh, you know, it could have been worse. Yeah, it could have. But this was a small town of only several thousand people. So when you scale it down like that, 46 people dying right before the holidays in December, every single one of those 46 people were someone to somebody in that town. Every single one of them were a father, a mother, a son, a daughter, an aunt, an uncle, a nephew, a niece, a cousin. It goes on and on. So... This bridge collapse that all of this strange activity was leading up to, and as I mentioned in the last video, seemed to cease after the collapse of the bridge. And when I say cease, maybe I didn't make it clear enough in the last video. 
it all stopped. According to all documented reportings and stuff, once the bridge collapsed, there were no more Mothman sightings in Point Pleasant. There were no more UFO sightings. There were no more strange lights in the sky. There were no more men in black. None. Nothing. None of the strange phenomena seemed to occur after the bridge collapsed, which is what a lot of people and skeptics who believe that this was just some big type of mass hysteria, and I touched on this previously, that it does make sense that once the bridge collapsed, reality hit, and you know, this was actually a big tragedy for a small town. This was actual reality happening, not all the strangeness that was happening the 13 months leading up to it. And it knocked them out of this hysteria. The, the whole hysteria angle and mass delusion, I'm going to have to put that back on the shelf and stick it there for a little. Just like I said with the crane thing, just so we have some logical things to grasp onto at the, near the end of this, when we start trying to really deduce what the most likely explanation for what happened in Point Pleasant with the Mothman could have possibly been. But the way the bridge collapse is shot and shown in the Mothman Prophecies film, it gets you. It really does. It really makes it hit home. Like, it's different hearing about and reading a, a paper that, I, that I've thrown up a few times on here, The Bridge Collapse 46 Dead. It's different reading that, and it's different seeing on screen. Yeah, it's a movie, of course. But still, the way it's shot, the way that you see all these people on the bridge scurrying for their lives and trying to get off this bridge before it collapsed and then just seeing the bridge start to come apart and then collapse. When this bridge collapsed, it was gone. Like, it all sunk and fell into the water underneath. There was no bridge left. And we'll talk more on the bridge disaster near the end because there's some very odd things and coincidences that tie into the bridge collapse, tying it all back into the Mothman sightings and everything like that. Now, the whole theory on the Mothman or similar winged creatures and cryptids and, and flying birdmen like the Thunderbird legends of the Native Americans that we've touched on before. These type of creatures, including people referring to it as either the same Mothman or another Mothman, have been seen just before disasters many other times. There's one example is Mexico City in 1985, just weeks before a major earthquake that shook the entire city. There was sightings of giant birds giant bird creatures flying above Mexico City for weeks leading up until this earthquake. In 1986, in the Ukraine, leading up to the incident at Chernobyl, locals were claiming to have seen, been visited by, been terrorized by a giant bird-like creature, a bird-like man, leading up to the accident at the power plant. So this creature has been seen as some type of harbinger of doom throughout history, but just Point Pleasant, Mexico City, Chernobyl, and those are just two other examples. There are a bunch out there. Like I said, I'll probably do an episode on similar and related winged cryptids. I'll touch more on that in that episode. Now, the whole movie adapted from the Mothman Prophecies. When I first saw the film, I was kind of disappointed. And I think that's only because I saw it in 2002 when it came out. So I was pretty young. 
and I was expecting a lot more, you know, Mothman, <laughs> and a lot more, like, I guess I was th expecting more of a documentary, you know, telling you about the Mothman and all the sightings and the UFO stuff, and that's not what you get in the film. And it actually, like I said earlier, with the way that Keel, you know, gathered this information and conducted his research down there, it makes sense the film is the way it is because it doesn't lean one way or the other. It doesn't lean towards this thing existed and this is true or anything like that. It just kind of presents the facts as they were told to Keel. And we see everything play out the way that it did historically with the bridge collapse. So when I revisited the film years later, that's when I fell in love with it. After a lot, a lot of time looking into, reading into, watching documentaries on this whole case of the Mothman, is when the Mothman prophecies, the film, really hit for me more than it ever did. So in the film, there's a lot of well, fucking prophecies <laughs> because of the title. And Will Patton plays a character in the movie who is basically based on Woodrow Derringer, who was the person who saw Indrid Cold, the extraterrestrial grinning man, who greeted him on his drive home. And started seeing him and having communications with Indrid Cold over this period of time. So, they don't call him uh, Derringer in the film. It's a different name. Same with Klein is the name of John Keel in the movie. And his life is semi-fabricated in the film as well. He's, his wife passes away at the beginning of the movie. So, there's, there's definitely changes to, I guess, make it not too autobiographical and, you know, to make it more of a film and cinematically pleasing and all that. But in the film, Derringer, we'll just call him Derringer, tells John Klein, Richard Gere's character, two different things. One, that he was told by Indrid Cold that 99 will die... And then several scenes later, in a diner, Richard Gere walks over to the TV, turns it up, and there was a flight crash where 99 people were presumed dead. So this was a premonition, a vision, a prophecy that was told supposedly from Injured Cold to Woodrow Derringer, and it turned out being true. Now, this is just in the film I'm speaking of. I do not remember if this happened in real life. I don't think it did. But then he also has another scene where he, he was told by Indrid Cold that 300 people would die. And then he shows a newspaper to Klein. And it ends up saying, Earthquake at the equator, over 300 dead. So prophecies did play a part in this case, Mary Heyer, the woman we've talked about who worked for the paper, she was having a lot of dreams, intense dreams, and she was having dreams of Christmas presents floating in the water. We also see this referenced by Laura Linney's character in the Mothman Prophecies when she recounts a dream that she had and this is basically where they took the inspiration for that. They said she was having a dream in the movie of Christmas presents floating in the water and she was drowning. Mary Heyer had these exact type of dreams. She had a very bad feeling that something major, a disaster, was coming. She's not the only one either. Aside from physical sightings, like in person, a lot of townspeople in Point Pleasant were having weird dreams like this. They were having strange premonitions or strange visions, and none of this could be explained. And again, going into the character of these witnesses, these are all people that were 
terrified at what they saw. And now we're going to dive into just a bunch of reported sightings from these eyewitnesses in Point Pleasant or right around it. These all take place in the 13 months from 66, November 15th, leading up to the bridge collapse in December 67. Linda Scarberry, who was one of the four, the two couples, the Scarberries and the Mallets, for the first official sighting of the Mothman in Point Pleasant by the TNT area, stated in an interview, we didn't know what we were looking at. We saw a big human creature. You could see the muscles in the legs. We sat there for a minute, looked at each other, and we ended up taking off. And this is when they proceeded to race back to town. We chased by this Mothman looming over the car. They were seeing it in the, in the rearview mirror, in the back window, the entire way back to town. Now, when they got back to town, they went straight to the police. <laughs> they went straight to the sheriff's office. They sent out a watchman. He couldn't find anything there. The creature was gone. Now, this is another thing. As I've said, these aren't people who are trying to get their 15 minutes of fame or trying to profit or anything like that off of saying they saw something weird. These people were regular, hard-working, church-going people, kind people, welcoming people. John Keel said he was extremely welcome in town. Same with other researchers in the UFO community, in the paranormal community, that also stopped by Point Pleasant to research these sightings that were going on. All said the same thing. They felt very welcome in town, but they all also said that you could tell something was off. You could tell that these people were in the middle of something strange. You can tell that there was odd things going on in Point Pleasant. The vibe radiated off of everybody in town, off of the town itself, that you could just feel the oddness in the air. But in addition to all the eyewitnesses and the which are civilians who saw this. There were police officers who saw this. There was a story of a blood van, an American Red Cross uh, blood van, that was chased down by the Mothman that was attacking this blood van. So not only do you have the civilians who lived in Point Pleasant, over a hundred of them in the 13-month span that saw this creature, or also saw UFOs, or the lights in the sky, the men in black who appeared in town, all of this stuff, you have officials that are seeing it too. You have police officers that saw it. You have people who worked for the American Red Cross, or the blood truck. So there's no way that all of these people are lying, and that all of these people are making this up. Now, when the Scarberries got back to, from the sheriff's office after getting chased into town, Linda Scarberry ended up going to her friend's house. And Doris says in an interview that Linda came in and she collapsed onto the ground, unconscious, just fainted. And then when she came to, they ended up calling the doctor. Doctor came and she was absolutely hysterical when she came into her house after seeing and being chased by the Mothman. Now the next day, the sheriff held a conference at the local courthouse about this sighting. So you could see already just from the first sighting that this was taken very seriously by the officials of the town. And this isn't the first time. There were actual hunts for the Mothman. There were people going out at night hunting this thing, trying to find out what this is and trying to kill it and try to prove that it actually exists. People in the town were afraid to go out at night. People started locking their doors, which in West Virginia in the late 60s, you weren't, people weren't locking the doors. They started to. 
after all of these sightings of the Mothman, the UFOs, the, the lights in the sky, they started locking the doors. They were afraid. Now, we've talked a lot about the red eyes of the Mothman. These glowing, intense red eyes that are reported with almost literally every sighting of the Mothman from 66 to 67. Now, a lot of the people who reported seeing and having an encounter with the Mothman contracted conjunctivitis or something similar to conjunctivitis or pink eye in one or both of their eyes after seeing the Mothman. Doctors couldn't explain it and one eyewitness even claimed that his one eye never healed. People were experiencing very, very strange dreams. Others who had encounters with the Mothman were affected mentally ever since. Like, there were people who sought out psychiatric help. There were people that thought they were going crazy. Like, so this... So all of this just keeps on reinforcing to me that something was happening here in this town. And this is just talking about the Mothman. This has nothing to do with the UFOs, the lights, injured cold, the men in black, the other strange occurrences happening in Point Pleasant for these 13 months. Now, when Keel came to Point Pleasant, and decided that you could feel just in the air and from the people that they were going through something, that something strange was happening here. He went around and started investigating these sightings. Besides all of the eyewitness reports that were reported, Keel talked to a number of people who never came forward with things that they saw because out of fear of sounding insane or crazy or out of fear of being ostracized from the community for for coming out with such weird things. But as he was going around gathering information and documenting these eyewitness sightings, more people that he talked to would, I guess, feel more comfortable and they would come out and tell him and say, well, I saw this or I saw this. I just, I never told anybody. So we have over a hundred documented sightings in 13 months in one area, Point Pleasant, the TNT area right north of it and all around it. That's strange on its own, but who knows how many people saw things that never came forward. Which Keel, as I said, said was a decent amount. Now, this sighting happened the day after the Scarberry Mallet initial sighting being chased from the TNT area back to town. This happened on the 16th of November in 66. And this is a very interesting one for me and a very compelling one involving this woman, Marcella Bennett. Her brother and her three-year-old daughter. They were going to the brother's house on the outskirts of the TNT area. Now, the brother noticed strange lights in the sky. And he said to Marcella, Look, there's, it's not a plane. There's strange lights in the sky. And she just brushed it off, oh, whatever, and ended up walking back to the car. And as she approached the car, holding her three-year-old daughter, she says she saw a creature out of the corner of her eye. It was about six feet tall with feathers that it looked just like a very big bird, but a man. And that it was standing with its shoulders up a bit, with its neck twisted down a little, so it kind of like a moth's head, how it doesn't, the neck doesn't extend. She is quoted saying she tried to run, but she panicked. She couldn't move. She couldn't run. And then she collapses on top of her three-year-old daughter, 
that she was holding. Onto the ground, she's on top of her three-year-old. And all she can say in an interview is, I, I knew I was on top of her. I figured she's dead. My, my, my daughter's dead. But I couldn't move. That I was in a trance. So when she regained her ability to move, she ended up picking up her daughter, who was fine, and she noticed her her knees were all cut up, her hands, like her face was buried in the sand during her trance-like state she was put into from seeing this creature, and she headed to, into the house. They ended up, the brother, her and her daughter, locking themselves into the house, calling the police, and didn't stop there. The creature continued to scurry onto the porch and look into the windows for several minutes before fleeing. And when the cops got there, it was too late, the creature was already gone. But this is a very interesting one to me, the fact that her three-year-old daughter was involved that this woman was holding her daughter her three-year-old and was so taken aback from what she saw and put into this trance-like state that she fell on top of her child and assumed she killed her assumed that she smothered or fell on top of and murdered her child but there was nothing she can do about it because she she was so frozen in fear she couldn't move. That is very very interesting to me. And Marcella Bennett says that it was the most horrifying experience she's ever had in her life, and she hope it's the last time <laughs> that she ever experienced something like that. And who could blame her? Now this is also one of those cases where I mentioned earlier that. Marcella ended up, for months, being severely affected by this encounter and ended up seeking like professional help for anxiety and for trauma and whatever you want to call it, PTSD, from this strange, unexplainable phenomenon that she experienced with her brother. Also speaking earlier of the visions and prophecies and dreams, she, to this day, decades and decades later, is still troubled by dreams and visions in her sleep from this encounter with the Mothman. And to just put yourself in these people's situation, to put yourselves in their shoes, in their state of mind at the time, seeing something like this that you can't explain, which, unfortunately... For me, I've never had any type of paranormal experience. I've never had any type of extraterrestrial experience. I've never seen a UFO. I've never seen weird lights in the sky. I've never seen a ghost. Never seen a phantom. Never seen a banshee. Which, speaking of banshees, are old Irish, Scottish you know, legends of that are also harbingers of doom. And people sometimes link these bird creatures, the Mothman and similar ones, to the legend of the Banshee, that the Banshee would let out a scream and stuff when someone was going to die or when something bad was going to happen. Same with Mothman being a harbinger of doom. But putting yourself in these people's shoes, having your three-year-old daughter in your arms and thinking you killed her, not knowing what you saw, are then being affected by this for the rest of your life. Like, this is a trauma that people were living with and continue to if they're still alive. It's the eyewitnesses who have actually had encounters with the Mothman. It's got to be terrifying. You got to feel like every day since then that your world and your reality has been turned upside down and you don't know what to make of what you saw. So some of these people were living every day of the rest of their lives in absolute fear and anxiety. And just that alone it is, is a travesty that people had to live like that. Even more so that they, they never got an answer 
They never got an explanation for what they saw. Now, Keel is even stated in an interview later in his life that these people, there was n hardly any, if if any, humor in their stories, that these were genuinely terrified people. These were genuinely puzzled people that had no idea what they experienced. So just my whole stance on Keel and how I feel that he was pretty unbiased going in and documenting these things. Now, of course, you can say he was into UFOs before this. He was a UFO researcher and into the paranormal, supernatural and stuff. So, of course, there is a bias. Just from researching these things, he's going to be gravitated towards wanting to believe it. But the way he reports it is very, very unbiased and just the facts and just the accounts that he hears he never made any final judgment as i said on what exactly happened here in boy pleasant when asked up until his death he still would say i have no idea what happened he has his theories like we've here like we're exploring but that's it and i think that's a good way to end this episode this was a little bit long but there was a lot in here. So episode five will be out in probably a few days. I'm going to keep the topic a surprise. And let's see if we can finally figure out the identity of the Mothman of Point Pleasant. Take care, guys. Thank you.